And welcome back to the Canadian Rec. This is Jamie coming to you from Ross City, New Brunswick, on the beautiful east coast of Canada. And exciting today, we have rugby legend, rugby Canada legend, uh, all around great guy, Mark Wyatt, joining us on our podcast. We'll get to Mark in a little bit. Uh, as always, got to do a little bit of plugging here and uh, contact me any way you can. We're on Twitter at Canadian Rock, Instagram, the underscore Canadian underscore Rock. Yeah, I know that one's a mouthful. Facebook at the Canadian Rock, and our email is the Canadian Rock at gmail.com. Feel free to reach out at any time. Uh, respond to polls that I post. Um, take a look at the photos I post of guests. If you have thoughts or comments, contact me via social media or drop me a Gmail. It's always cool too. And as always, we're on a variety of platforms. You can watch us on YouTube. Make sure you're subscribing or following to that channel. And we're also on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, and CastBox where we stream. So make sure when you're doing that, you're following, you're subscribing, but even more importantly is sharing those messages. Uh, I've got a lot of great uh, Canadian listeners that enjoy listening to these rugby stories. We also have fans over in, in Japan, and we have fans in the UK and fans in New Zealand and fans in, in the USA. So uh, if, if you know somebody that's a rugby friend, share. If you know somebody that's... Uh, that's interested in listening to stories about athletes and how they get to where they are, share it. Um, if you know somebody that enjoys learning about athletes that struggle with mental health, share it because we've had a few pods on about that. If you people that are interested in the Black Lives Matter movement, we've had a few pods with that as well. So just share it, get it out there. Uh, that's the plug for this week. And if you forget where to go, the simplest is to go to our website, thecanadianruck.weebly.com. Everything's there. Everything from links to the YouTube, links to the Spotify, upcoming guests, past guests, uh, where we stream, uh, some of my favorite pods. So there's a bit of everything there for you, uh, and that is probably the simplest place uh, if you're if you're stuck as to where to go. That's uh, that's the simplest place. The Canadian Well, we're going to change things up a little bit this week. There's uh, there's no great area this pod. Uh, it's a great conversation kind of with Mark, and I want that to be the, the primary focus. It always is. The guests are always the primary focus, but sometimes I, I, I you know, rant and rave a little bit about some things that uh, in the rugby world that I think needs to be looked at. But this week, we're just going to do a little bit of rugby news, and then we're going to jump into the, uh, the great conversation with Mark. So as you know, New Zealand rugby just finished, the Super Rugby Aotearoa. Uh, I always struggle with that word, so I apologize to any of my Kiwi fans listening. And um, the Crusaders won again, so, you know, four years straight that they've won Super Rugby. And uh, But due to a, a bit of a COVID uh, resurgent in, some, in, in an area in New Zealand, that final match between the Crusaders and Blues, the top two teams, Crusaders already won, but it would have been a, a, a dandy finish there, the number one and number two seeds battling out. Uh, Aaron Smith, Got his 100th cap there, I believe. Uh, test cap with, sorry, not test cap, his 100th cap with, uh, oh, geez, with the Highlanders on the weekend when they when they hosted the Hurricanes. Um, so it is a is a great weekend all the way around. Uh, it's a shame that the New Zealand rugby's done because that was been a it's been a highlight for the last couple months for sure. But saying that on August 29th, so only you know a week and a half, two weeks away, the North versus South match is happening. All rosters have been finalized finally, so all the greats were there. We're going to be there, Bowden Barrett, the Sam Whitelock, the Canes, Moongas, McKenzie's, more like RD Sevilla. Like they're all going to be there taking place in that game. Uh, again, August 29th, they're trying to find a, a new venue because where it was supposed to be hosted is uh, in the COVID area. So there, uh, I think there's going to be some changes to that, but that'll be, uh, that'll be a great match. Hopefully we can find that online or on TV or somewhere. Hopefully TSN uh, is playing that for us. Saying that, um, been watching a little bit of the rugby AU, the rugby Australia. It's plugging along, and it's it's interesting to watch. There's definitely some fun matches. It's a lot of high scoring rugby, a lot of offense first, which is which is fun. Uh, defense is a little shoddy, um, you know, some more handling errors. But there's a lot of young young players in those Aussie teams that uh, you can tell in a few years it's going to be it'll be really good for Australian rugby. Right now they're struggling a bit, but I think if they can hold the fort. Um, Within within a few years, they're going to be uh, they're going to be a pretty strong program again there in, in Australia. And saying that, with New Zealand done, Australia finishing up here shortly, rugby in the Northern Hemisphere is finally taken off back after a five month delay. And on the weekend, we're not going to get into the games, but there was a boatload of games on the weekend, uh, a lot of excellent rugby. So if you if you hadn't had a chance, you know, find streams of it somewhere. You can get the DAZN app. 
Uh, I think it's like 20 bucks a month and that gives you all those Northern Hemisphere matches. If not, um, you know, Sports Net World, I think, carries it. Um, there are different options, but there's a lot of great games being played over in the Northern Hemisphere right now as well. And more on the home front, Rugby Canada has handed out their hardware for 2019. So I'd like to say and give a huge congrats to the following because it's a pretty impressive list. We got the Canadian Shield winner, uh, Pat Parfrey out of Newfoundland, and Pat's going to be a guest on here soon. And we have the Julian Florence Award, which went to Olivia Merchant, and Good New Brunswick, Good New Brunswick girl. Uh, the player of the year for the men's 15, Matt Heaton out of Quebec and plays for Rugby Atlanta, I believe, and he's going to be a guest soon as well. Player of the year in the women's 15, again, goes back to Olivia Merchant, so Olivia picks up two awards, which is awesome. Player of the year for men's sevens is Nate Hirayama out of BC. Player of the year for women's seven is Britt Ben out of Ontario. Young player of the year uh, for the males is Will Persilio out of BC, and the same for me females goes to Elizabeth Gibson out of Ontario. Coach of the Year goes to Aaron McDonald of Ontario. And for the females, it goes to Catherine Lang out of Alberta. And Match Official of the Year, so this is a neat one, Sandra, San, Shanda Mosher Delant out of BC. So she, she's going to be a guest coming up as well on, the, on a rugby, rugby ref uh, style pod. Our Volunteer of the Year goes to Ian McLean out of BC. And then our Provincial Union of the Year uh, for 2019 is Rugby Alberta. And then you get to your 2019 Hall of Fame inductees, you got John Graff, Dave Logheed, who's uh, com committed to being a guest, Maureen McMahon, uh, McMahon Dr. Natasha Wesh, Dr. Preston Wiley, and the 2013 National Senior Women's Sevens Team. So huge congrats to all of those, um, all of those recipients of the uh, 2019 Rugby Canada Awards and Hall of Fame inductees. That's uh, uh, high, high regards, high honors for all of you. So congratulations. So coming up next, there's a great picture for you on YouTube of uh, Time Magazine uh, there's, with a little piece cut out there with Mark Wyatt uh, kicking a, uh, attempting to kick a goal. Uh, so Mark's coming up next, scored 227 points with Rugby Canada, played in the inaugural Rugby World Cup in, uh, in New Zealand back in 87. And then in the 91 Rugby World Cup, he was the captain of that famous Canadian team that is the only Canadian team to date that's make it out, that made it out of the group stages. And he, we go into detail on those two, those two tourneys. And uh, back, in, uh, back in 1991, he set a world record here in St. John, New Brunswick, when New Brun uh, sorry, when Canada hosted Scotland, he kicked eight penalties in a 24-19 win, um, which was amazing. I got to watch that game, uh, and that record stood for 10 seasons. And he was also just recently inducted into the Rugby World Cup Hall of Fame for Canada. Sorry, not the Rugby World Cup, but Rugby Canada Hall of Fame. And uh, huge kudos to Mark for that. Well-deserved, and uh, it's great to see him. And so he'll be coming up right after this short sponsor. Our sponsor this week, uh, this pod goes to Eastward Sales Limited here in St. John. Uh, Eastward Sales has been a St. John company since 1978, so 42 years. They are print shops specializing in wide format and specialty printing, such as posters, blueprints, canvas, signs, banners like the one behind me, and lamination. So the, the banners behind me was, uh, was made quite quickly. Now, they also offer a great deal of art supplies, which is great for schools, daycare centers, and other areas as well. They also offer an online file submission with a quick turnaround. I sent Coin, the, the owner of the business, uh, the Canadian Rec logo, what can you do? And the next day he had that banner made for me. And if you saw my, my social media post, the, uh, the license plate for my car as well. So if you need to know how to get there, go to ESLREPRO.com and ask for Coin. All right, ESLREPRO.com. That is their website and ask for Coin. Coming up now, Mark Wyatt. All right, and welcome back to the Canadian Rec. We're very fortunate and honored today to have Canadian legend Mark White joining us. Mark, welcome to the Canadian Rec. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks for the invite. Appreciate it. Appreciate all the great work you're doing for rugby in Canada and getting the message out and bringing some really cool individuals to the table. Not that I'm one of them, but thank you for bringing <laughs> the others. Oh, I think you are for sure. Yeah. All right, Mark, let's start right into this. So through my research, I found you were born in Bermuda, which I didn't know. Mm -hmm. When did you come to Canada? Well, the, a, a little bit of an interesting story, modern day story. Uh, parents were trying to get away from both sets of in-laws, uh, lived in the UK, moved to Bermuda, and um, I was born there. And then they were planning to move to Sydney, Australia. And my dad was going to do a recon, and um, 
and ended up landing in Vancouver and said uh, before he, he was flying off to Sydney, Australia, and came over to the island to visit uh, some friends of his and arrived in, in April and May. And, and the West Coast in April and May is stunning. And he turned around and said, you know what, we're canceling our tickets to Sydney, Australia, and now we're, we're going to move to Victoria. That's so we ended up in Victoria, and I was about six years old when we arrived. That is pretty neat. Like just on the drop of a hat, well, we're just going to stay here then. Yeah, yeah, it was bizarre. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I had very vague recollections of it, but sort of latterly uh, in your life, when you start talking to your parents, trying to get a sense of what was going on, I mean, they they were trying to get as far away from their in-laws as they possibly could, and they figured the other part of the world, the other side of the world, Sydney would be a long way to go. Fair enough. Um, so uh, anyway, they settled in Victoria, and I'm grateful they did. So what what did your dad do that he had that flexibility to kind of choose Canada like that? He was uh, he was a middle manager and. In, in corporations. So just before uh, they made the move to Bermuda, he was actually, I think they were considering Portugal uh, and he was going to be managing or help manage a company over there. So he's, he was a guy, sort of a jack of all trades. And that was back, back in the 50s and 60s when uh, there were lots of jobs and you were able to float around a little bit, provided you had a certain skill set, uh, which he had. And uh, so, yeah, it wasn't difficult for him to find work. That's cool. So you moved to Canada, you're about six years old. When did you start like rugby? Was it high school, university? How did you get involved? What was that process like for you? It was a great nine at Lansdowne and a former national team scrum half, Daryl Nulet was uh, my Spanish teacher as well as um, uh, the rugby coach. And he didn't teach phys ed, but uh, which is uh, historically anyway, the natural pathway into, uh, into rugby, to, particularly in Canada. Anyway, you, you sort of pick it up at school. At least it used to be. It's not the case anymore, sadly. Um, uh, at least in the public school settings. And so, yeah, so Daryl, Daryl Moulet just said, hey, why don't you come out and uh, give this a go? And, uh, and I said, I came out and started running around. I kind of liked it. And we also had um, Dave Cutler of Edmonton Eskos fame was uh, in his off season. He was a substitute teacher at the school. And, I, and he uh, was teaching business, and I was a bit of a pain in the butt in one particular class. And he said, yeah, Wyatt, I'll see you after school. You've got a principal, and it's, or basically a detention, and this is, uh, this is what you're doing. I said, well, what am I doing? He said, well, why don't you come down to the field? I'll see you on the field at, uh, at 3 o'clock. So I went and served my detention. My detention was shagging footballs for him while he was practicing kicking. So he'd kick all the balls. I'd stand under the post and try and catch them and run them back to him. So it was a combination of my involvement with uh, Dave Cutler and Daryl Millette that got me interested in rugby. And Dave got me interested in kicking a football, even though he kicked with his toe. It, it just, it, the whole process kind of intrigued me. So I started mucking around with it and that's how I got started. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dave's a great guy. So is Daryl, but Dave's quite a character, a fantastic guy. So I see him from time to time. He's uh, yeah, a lot of good laughs. All those uh, all those great cup rings hanging off his off his hand. Yeah, yeah, he's a fantastic character. I don't think I could. Uh, I don't think there probably would have been a more suitable detention for you either at the time. Probably. <laughs> no, exactly right. Exactly right. It'd be wiping down chalkboards back in the day when they had chalkboards. That's right. <laughs> So you got involved in grade nine, played your high school. What about university? Like, where did you go after high school? I, I actually, uh, what uh, the sort of pivotal moment, there's a really strong James Bay connection to, to this. And, and the Bays, uh, you know, certainly on the West Coast and nationally, really, and I'd say internationally, have had a massive impact on the game. And uh, Daryl was a James Bay uh, player, at, you know, my, um, my junior high school coach. And then I ended up at, uh, at Vic High with Tillman Briggs. And, um, and so uh, Tillman was, uh, was, a, was a fantastic mentor, fantastic coach. And when we, you and I were talking about earlier about establishing values and making sure that, that uh, rugby was more about developing skills and, and is, was as much about developing skills as it is about developing people and developing good people and establishing strong values. And Tillman was all about values and meeting expectations and making sure that you delivered on what you said you were going to do. So in terms of a coach and mentor, he was fantastic. And so not only was he good at the, uh, prevent, uh, at the high school level, he was really good at the club level. And subsequently he went on to coach uh, Canada as well. And I was fortunate enough to move with him through those different paths. So I was at Vic High under Tillman Briggs and we ended up winning a, winning a BC championship. And through um, some family circumstances, I ended up uh, leaving 
and through my uh, grade 12 year and not completing. So I had to go back to school and I didn't want to go back to Vic High. So I ended up uh, at Oak Bay High School. And at the time, Gary Johnson, another uh, James Bay guy, was, um, was teaching there. And I think it was his second year. And uh, we ended up winning the BC Championship that year as well. And so I, at the same time, I was playing um, senior men's soccer on, um, or on Sunday and senior men's rugby on Saturday. And I wasn't sure what direction I was going to go. And uh, it was Gary Johnson that, um, that, that said, look, you, you might want to consider rugby over soccer. And he spent a lot of time with me at the, at the, at the white spot. Uh, uh, Friday mornings before classes, just trying to talk and talk me out of taking the soccer path and, and heading into rugby. So that whole James Bay influence was quite significant in my life at that point in time. And Gary went on to, uh, to coach the first World Cup team as well. And another guy that was a real hard driver and, and all, these, all these, these rugby guys have these massive personalities that make them so interesting. And certainly Jono is, is, is one of those guys that stands out in a room. Um, and he was very, very good about establishing discipline, and he was tough on the guys, and, and the guys responded. And uh, so, yeah, there's a big James Bay influence there. And then when I graduated from Old Bay, I was headed to UVic and trying to decide at that point in time whether I was going to play soccer at UVic or rugby at UVic. And, um, and just through circumstance and through Gary Johnson's input, I ended up choosing rugby under uh, Bruce Howe and Dave, uh, Dave Doherty. That's awesome. Um, yeah. I'm going to throw a question out that's not on that's not on the docket. So if it's not one you want to answer, I'll just edit this out. Um, okay. Coming from the West Coast, BC has predominantly been the strongest rugby province in Canada. Ontario is getting there now. What does the rest of the country have to do to help our national side? Like, we've got some talented players in the Maritimes, um, but the exposure maybe we don't have, or we don't have. Uh, we don't have access to be able to maybe the financial needs or the financial wherewithal to get some of our players to BC, to castaways, to whoever, so that they can go and try and advance up the ranks. Can Rugby Canada help out? Is it just, is our country too, too large? Um, is, uh, is there a lot of things that mitigate that from helping our national team become better? Our women's side's great, but our men's side's been, you know, stumbling for years. I mean, I think it's, it's changing its direction now. I think Kingsley Jones is a great coach. He's got a great philosophy there, but what can what can happen to make all provinces more effective in creating good rugby people and good rugby players? What do you think? Ooh, that's that's a tough one. A bit of a loaded question, too, Jamie. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> in the sense, it, it, I mean, th this this debate has gone on since the dawn of time, right? Since when I got first got involved, this this discussion was a hot topic item as well. And and I think it's really easy for for all of us to default and point fingers at at Rugby Canada and say, hey, you guys are responsible for developing the game, and well, how come you're not doing more? I I'm I'm not. I don't subscribe to that. Um, I I think if if you want to grow the game. You you got to focus on on the game organically and and take a look at what you're doing inside your own communities in order to foster the game i, I think the biggest challenge we've got is 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 a geographic one uh you take a look at some of these uh these countries that are starting to blossom it seems like portugal for example at the u20 level have uh, just come on like gangbusters but you know you stick you stick that massive population in a very small geographic area it's going to be really really easy to deliver high, high performance programs um, that, are, that are economical. So we're not only are we finding geography, but the only other thing I'd, I'd encourage certainly uh, east of the Rockies is change of seasons, you know, which is, <laughs> you know, we, we can play 12 months out of the year and we can, show, we can be outside and running around, which is a distinct advantage for us. Whether that's a, a um, you know, a, a legitimate benefit, I, I, I personally believe it is. I mean, this is, you know, you get a four month season, I think, uh, everywhere else in the, uh, in the um, in the country, but here on the west coast, we've got 10, 12 months. So I think the uh, the seasons do play a big factor. Now the counter argument to that is, do you know, do you need an eight month long season or a 10 month long season? And some would say, no, you don't. But we do have the blessing of having the alternative to uh, to be on the fields and training outside. And and you know, so we we and also I think BC historically has. Uh, has, have, have deep roots within the community and all the communities for rugby, but that's waned over time as well. And, uh, you know, people are looking to BC as a model. I'm, I'm not so sure it is uh, the model. It's a model. 
um, that when, when you coming back to your, your point of what we can do, certainly in the men's national team, the reintroduction to the pride of that pride program with uh, Jamie Cudmore uh, at the helm, I think is a step back in the right direction. I'm not sure that creating the same mousetrap is going to develop, deliver the same results as it has done historically, but to me it makes sense. And I look back to when Gary Johnson was coaching the uh, national team before the uh, sort of the, that late 80s, early 90s run, and he said, at the time said you want to play for Canada what rightly or wrongly and you know I'm not I don't mean to offend anybody that's listening to this sort of outside of uh, as I said east of the Rockies but the reality was he said you want to play for Canada you got to live in DC there were a few exceptions to that rule but by and large everyone migrated so you had this uh, hyper competitive league and you had these um, the uh, the leagues all throughout southern Vancouver Island and the lower mainland in Vancouver that had these players involved in the in the game on a on a day to day basis that then became sort of I won't say rugby sort of local cultural icons that pe that would draw people into the game. They also elevated the status of the game, and it was really super easy for us to train together. Um, but they, you know th this uh, this is pre professional days, and the, and the model's completely different. So it's tough to draw comparisons, but um, you know, coming back to this thing, the fact that this pride has been resurrected, I think, is a good thing because uh, you're going to locate these uh, these players in in a in a somewhat competitive league, being the Premier League. Yeah, absolutely. You you made a couple of good points. One about the pride, the other about seasons, and uh, here are high school seasons in the spring, um, which is still I find it absurd because by the time the snow's gone here in the Maritimes, it's middle of April. Mm -hmm. you know, and you, you, you might, you, maybe you're in the gym a few times, like, you know, passing the ball, but you don't actually get on a pitch and tackle and, you know, scrum contact until mid April, sometimes if you're lucky. So I've often lobbied that rugby should be in the fall because you have, you know, that's when our senior season is. You could tie in that club based value w within the communities, like St. John here of the Trojans. And there's mm -hmm. in the St. John area, there's like eight high schools that play rugby. You know, wouldn't it be cool if, you know, St. John High School and my school, Rossi Netherwood, played a game Saturday at one o'clock or, you know, 11 o'clock. Then right after at one was the St. John Trojans girls game. And then right after that was the St. John Trojans men's game. And then you, get, you have this whole day of rugby kind of developing around that club atmosphere um, that you try and instill to try and get players to continue to stay playing the game. Right. And your season can run a little bit longer. The, the, the downside is then we would butt heads with football. Right. Yeah, and I, I don't know what um, what the makeup is of your teams are there, or what the draw is from football. I, I think there's been a reliance in some communities to, uh, or certainly a suggestion that that uh, that that these football guys uh, transfer into rugby or the rugby guys transfer into football. It's probably more rugby going to football than football coming to rugby. Uh, but we've had this debate in small areas here on the island, and we just find that the uh, on the island the, those football guys never the real football guys never really it never really worked. So if you're using that as an argument, it it, it could be a straw man argument. For example, is not moving that particular league. I, I certainly the more opportunity you get for a longer season, I'd, I'd take advantage of it for yeah, sure for and sure. get guys playing. I mean, it's, it's uh, the other thing you guys are fighting too is summer times. You got families that'll want to go on vacation and bugger off and do other things or move, go away out of province, and that's going to impact uh, not only participation but retention rates as well. Yeah. So anything you guys can do to mitigate that will go an awful long way. But I, I don't 100% buy the football argument as as being legitimate. But also, I, it's not a culture I know or, or understand that I've been involved with. So, you know, those comments uh, may not ring true for everybody. No, that's fair. But, um, yeah, and the, the other thing, too, and you, you bring up a good point, you know, October, November hits uh, um, sort of back east, and, and you're done. You're indoors until February, right? February, March. You know, whereas here, we're playing all throughout the winter, and then when the season's over, touch starts up right away. So yeah. the guys are handling out in parks and, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about this a little bit later, but uh, guys, um, through the, because uh, it's something you put in an email to me asking about this over 45 touch. <laughs> you know, you guys are playing touch all summer. So yeah. they got their hands on the ball, balls are being whipped about, and then guys are taking those balls home and then their little brothers are starting to chuck them around and throw them. So there's this introduction that's very organic to the game uh, that we have the benefit of simply because uh, we've got a longer season to deal you with. Have the, yeah, you have the time for it for yeah. sure. Um, all right. Well, let's jump back in here. You were talking about, uh, I, I, sorry, I guess 
watching your, your career a little bit, I was younger, but you played nine years with Canada, had two Rugby World Cups with the inaugural one in New Zealand in 87, and then in Europe in 91 when the only Canadian team that went to the quarters. Can you talk to us about those two events? Like that first World Cup in New Zealand would have been historic, would have been amazing. And then you, and then you follow that up with a, a great run in, in Europe in 91. Talk, can you talk to us about those two experiences? Sure. Yeah, the, the 87 experience was an interesting one when I look back on it now, because I, I don't think anybody knew what this thing was going to become, right? Or what they were doing. You know, the, the rugby, I'm sure the uh, International Rugby Board at the time was looking at this guy, well, soccer's got one. Well, let, let's host a World Cup. And where are we going to have it? We're going to have it here. And, you know, they tried introducing all sorts of weird things like cheerleaders into the rugby. And, and just, it was really, really interesting watching that whole process unfold. But it, 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 for me personally, and for all the guys that were involved, to be a part of the inaugural World Cup is, is, uh, is, is a pretty special time. And it, it gave, I think it gave, it gave rugby the opportunity to elevate its profile within, uh, on a global perspective, uh, to the point now that I'm stating what everybody already knows if you're a rugby player. I mean, the World Cup is the third watched, the most watched uh, sporting event in the world after the FIFA World Cup and the Olympics. I mean, that, that's what's come of this, and it certainly helped. I, I, I'm not sure that, that rugby's a global game yet, um, but uh, certainly participation levels, when you look at countries participating in different sports, rugby's doing pretty well. We're over 100 nations, and I know we're a hockey nation, and whenever I'm asked this question or something similar to it in terms of its global impact, you look at hockey, there's only 50 national teams in the world. You know, whereas World Cup, there are more, there are, there, in terms of soccer, there are more um, national teams than there are countries. So you've got principalities like Andorra and Morocco that have their own national teams, but aren't actually countries. So that has a global reach. And I think rugby's moving towards that global reach as well. You know, when we get into, into the African countries, uh, you know, we hope to see more growth there. Um, so coming back to this thing, the, 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 that inaugural World Cup in 1987 provided uh, the rugby community for an opportunity to grow. And it was an unbelievable experience. And it was one from um, a player's perspective dealing with Canada that we were about as well prepared as we could have been. Uh, and Gary Johnson drove us. We had full contract, uh, contact practices and leading two days up before an international, which is just unheard of. We were so banged up going into that thing, but we were pretty, pretty strong and pretty tough. And I'm not a particularly tough, hard guy, but I tell you what, you're running into guys constantly because those were really difficult practices. And Gary Johnson borderline had a mutiny in his hands. And <laughs> great, one of my greatest memories of hands to Goody. And, and uh, for those that haven't seen his halftime speech against Tonga, that was, that was hands to Goody, to a T. He walked onto the bus after we were grumbling, after smashing into one another again for an hour and a half, wondering, why are we doing this? We've you know, we, we got guys injured and taped. I went in my first World Cup because I got stitches above my head with the red bandages. And why were you wearing that goofy headband? I said, well, I had stitches in my head from the practice two days before. <laughs> so anyway, we were all whining and complaining. And Hans walked on the bus and gave one of those speeches that just everybody just sunk back in their seat and just went, Oh my God, I think he's right. Even, even though deep down in, in uh, some of us just wanted to say, no, you're wrong. We shouldn't be doing this. He said, you know what? You're right. And basically it was stop your whining, get back in your seats, get back up on the training field. And if you think it's going to be hard, it's going to be hard against Wales. It's going to be hard against Ireland. Do you think they're complaining about their training? It was epic. He went on about a two or three minute rant and there was silence on the bus until we got back to the hotel. So it was, it was a challenging World Cup from the perspective that um, not only are you in a new environment, a lot of us hadn't been uh, exposed to these sorts of things, but it was challenging on the physical level too. And we beat Tonga and we had Ireland, uh, we were ahead of Ireland uh, partway through the second half and uh, then the wheels came off. And then Wales was a travesty, as I don't want to talk about because I don't want to dump on referees, but uh, it, was, uh, it was a case of we are not going to let your, this little minnow of Canada disrupt the order. And there were just uh, so many bizarre calls that went against us. Not saying we would have ever beaten Wales on that day, but we shouldn't, we, there's no way we, they were 40 points better than us on that day. And so yeah, overall it was, it was fantastic. And then that was a good segue into 91. Gary Johnson took us to about 88. Then uh, there was a change, Ian Burtwell got involved and Burtwell who's also a member of the, uh, 
uh, Canadian Rugby Hall of Fame, um, a superb guy. Um, it, it took him two vastly different coaches. Uh, uh, Jono was, this is the way it's going to be done. This is my way. This is my team. And this is the way because I think I've got the right program. Burtwell took a slightly different approach, which, well, not slightly, dramatically different, which was a lot more inclusive, soliciting feedback from senior players. Um, and uh, everything was designed around patterns in multiple phases. So Ian saw, he was spending a lot of time with the New Zealand coaching staff as well and saw the evolution of the game where uh, it became a lot more structured, but um, it, it also involved a lot more player input. And so he took us into that 91 World Cup and we were very, very well prepared. And um, I, th I think we had some, not I think, I know we had some excellent results uh, leading up to that. Um, prior to that World Cup. And then going in, uh, uh, the, I, the, the rugby pundits had us finishing third in that pool. We knew, we knew in our hearts we were going to finish second and could finish first. And so the first, so we didn't get by Fiji, we were going to be done. And we knew that. And unfortunately for me, the Thursday before the, before the, um, the match, we were playing on a, or training on a pretty slippery surface. And I twinged my groin, so I had to sit out that game and, and watch it from the sidelines, which was a difficult thing to do. Yeah. And, uh, and the guys just stepped up and delivered. I mean, Fiji is so unpredictable. You give them a scrap of possession, and they are gone. And we just shut them down, completely shut them down. And it, they not, didn't get any momentum at all, and we ended up winning by 10 points, which, coincidentally, I predicted before the game, exactly 10 points. Um, and then it was off to Romania, and we knew that was our birth into the quarters. And uh, that was a match, a very, very good match for us that uh, we let go maybe 10 minutes the entire time. We put the, took the foot off the gas, I think, to score two tries, and we let them sort of back into the game. But it was also a game that I knew when I was standing on that field, I said, we're not losing this game. I already know that. So we just got to make sure we control the parts that we need to control. And we just ground them down. And one of the defining features of that team was that massive pack up front. Uh, they were huge. I think we had uh, the largest, the heaviest pack there, if not the second largest after England might have been first, I don't recall now. But um, we had one of the top two packs in terms of weight, but we had a very, very big athletic and uh, dare I say a nasty group of guys up there. <laughs> and you know, going into a World Cup, you want a bunch of tough men up there that are capable of dealing with stuff. And, uh, and I look back on that, and that was definitely a pivotal moment for us as a, as a national team, is having those guys in the engine room. Um, sort of late into the second half against Romania, they, I got a penalty that was about five meters out uh, from, the, from, the, um, from the touch line, or pardon me, from the goalpost and about five meters back. And I went, I don't think I'm going to kick this. So I, had, I talked to Glenn, I said, why don't, we, why don't we take the scrum and just grind them down? And they just went, yep, let's do it. And we pushed them over. And because we, we knew three points was going to be, you know, inconsequential, but yeah. psychologically a pushover try at that stage of the game, yeah. the game's over. Yeah. And it was, it was over after that. And, that's, um, and then, then of course, it, there was jubilation and, and pandemonium within our camp. And all of a sudden, yeah, we're off to the World Cup, uh, <laughs> into the quarterfinals. I don't know where that came from, but uh, yeah, I just... Thinking back on that, I don't think I've had that kind of an emotional response, actually. Yeah. That's fair. It was, yeah, uh, anyway, it was... Take, uh, a, take, a, take a second. Yeah. The, you, guys, yeah. you guys made it into the quarters, and yeah, it was New Zealand. Uh, yeah, well, we had France to go through first. Right. right? And we, ended up, uh, we ended up playing France, uh, you know, our hosts. And uh, that was a game, out of all the games I've played in, the, uh, my biggest resentment was not beating those guys. We had them on the hooks and, and we let them off. And, uh, and I, think, I think a lot of that, some of that had to do with maturity as, as a rugby playing nation to recognize the fact that, you know, we knew we could compete, but I'm not sure we were 100% sure we could beat the top six. We could compete, but not sure whether we could beat them. And that was a psychological barrier that we had to get through. And I think that French game at the end of the French one, it was pretty quiet in the dressing room. You know, most people would be celebrating. You only lost to France by six points. Well, you know what? We, we should have beaten them. And we just, there were a couple of times in that game where mental lapses, uh, of the French are a little like the Fijians. You give them a scrap of possession and a hole to go through and they're gone. Yeah. And they can make you look pretty silly. Yeah. And, um, and that, at the time, the French were very, very good at handling. They saw, they saw a gap. 
I just remember watching this and we had some uh, defensive lapses that we agreed that we were not going to uh, slide on defenses with pinch and hit guys. And one guy missed his assignment and they were through and gone. And then the game was over. We couldn't come back. But uh, that one, that one hurt because we, we it, it could have been a different outcome. You know, we were playing against going on to the course to play the defending uh, uh, world champions. And who knows, I think we would have been better suited against England than we would have been against uh, against New Zealand. Even that, so New that, Zealand that, was game wasn't, that New Zealand game wasn't that bad. It was like a, what, 27 to nine or? It yes, wasn't. yes, I think, that, I think that's about right. And that, and that flattered them um, uh, in terms of the scoreline. Uh, like most of the games we played in, we controlled the second half um, and we let in some soft tries early on. And, uh, yeah, but uh, if, if the game had been 15 minutes longer, there would have been a different outcome. But you know, the game isn't 15 mm. minutes longer. That was, a, that was another one that at the end of that, we went, you know what, we can do this. And, and that was a defining moment for, I think, at that particular point in time for Canadians, particularly the rep, sorry, that's my line going, my business line right now. It'll kick into uh, answer mode in just a sec. Yeah. Um, the, you, want to pause? Uh, you can answer it, I can pause. Yeah, it might be Al Sharon telling me to stop the interview. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Anyway, yeah, it was, it was that uh, defining moment for us as a rugby playing nation and as players to go, okay, we can do this. And so gone were the behaviors that, that uh, when I first got involved, people would be sitting on a bus going to play, say Ireland, going, oh, I can't believe that so-and-so is going to be on the field today. And I'm thinking, what the, f are you seriously having this conversation right now? We're supposed to go and beat these guys. I don't want to be talking about because that guy was in a magazine somewhere. But that was the attitude, the prevailing attitude for the early part of the 80s that, you know, people were still hero worshiping these, these guys who were just 15 guys with boots on and that we got to smack them and put them down. We got to score more points than they do. But I think that that, uh, that All Blacks game changed that, uh, that mindset completely. So that's, that's neat because that kind of ties in with my next question. 87. You were a prominent member, but rolling around in 91, I believe you were one of the captains. Mm -hmm. So what did you do to help teach and mentor? So you, you talk about that, you know, going to Ireland, the guys are talking about individuals that are playing. What was your role or what did you take on as your role as the captain to make sure those other guys were ready and confident that they could beat the France as they could compete and potentially beat New Zealand, they could beat Romania. Like what, what did you do to help those guys understand that? You know, it was, it's, it, at that level, it's less about mentoring and it's got more to do with role modeling and, and preparation and tactics on the field and recognizing the need when you need to change those tactics. I mean, if, if you got to, if, if I've got to spend two or three minutes, uh, you know, in some impassioned talk to get guys motivated to, to play against uh, France or, or England or New Zealand, then they shouldn't be in that change room. So uh, the, it was never about that from my perspective. It's, uh, and I, I tend to be a value, values-based guy. So my leadership style was staying true to those values. And, um, but the mentoring side of thing wasn't as much of an issue uh, in terms of getting these guys prepared. It was more making sure that, that as a group, we were as cohesive as we could be. Because national teams are no different than club teams and university teams, high school teams, both men and women. You've got cliques that form. You've got, you've got dynamics that go on within those cliques that could impact um, the overall performance and mental set of those teams going into games. So it was trying to find ways of keeping everybody together and keeping everybody focused on the same thing. Um, you know, you've got a very, at least with that 91 World Cup team, you had a lot of very strong personalities and individuals in there. And, you, you know, you're not, you're not changing mindsets there. What you're trying to do is, is harness that energy to get everybody to perform together on the field. And that's one thing that team would do for one another is they'd live and die for one another on the field. There yeah. is no question about that. Uh, absolutely. And that ties into in 1991, May of 91, I was 14 going on 15. I think I was in grade eight or nine. And Team Canada came to St. John, played Scotland. You guys won 24-19, which it was amazing atmosphere. And you scored all 24 points, which mm -hmm. at the time was a world record. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that match? Do you remember, do you remember doing that? 
I don't remember if someone asked me, do you remember each kick? No, I, I remember, I remember bits and pieces of it. I, I think what it, well, not, I think, I know what I remember the most was about, um, about is assessing what was going on in the game and managing that game situation, trying to determine how do we, keep, how do we close Scotland down? And that first half, and this comes back to uh, what I was mentioning earlier is that that fundamental belief, can we compete? And, and um, the previous, uh, I think it was a year before, a year and a half before, in, uh, in Victoria, we had lost to Ireland. Uh, Canada lost to Ireland uh, at, at Centennial, I think it was at Centennial Stadium at UVic um, on the last play of the game. Um, and that would have been the first time we had beaten a, uh, one, of the, one of the home nations um, ever. And, and we lost in the last play of the game. So going into the Scotland game, and it was all part of this World Cup preparation, it was beginning to, yeah, we can give this a go. And we never perceived Scotland as being a big threat. Uh, a number of the players that were involved in the 15s were also involved in the sevens. And we had played Scotland lots. And Scotland seemed to be, at the time, an easy target for us. I don't know why, maybe it was a psychological thing. When, uh, the, uh, when Scotland came out for the tour of Canada, uh, BC beat Scotland, the tide almost beat Scotland. I mean, so it, our mindset around the Scottish was we can beat these guys. Uh, so what do we need to do to beat them? And Ian Burtwell had us super prepared for that game. And we played into a headwind for the first half. And I, I don't even, I can't recall what the, for the score was at halftime, but it was a bit of an even match. And I knew that anytime I won the toss and, and we had a strong wind, I never took the wind. I always wanted to play into it. And that's what we did. We won the toss. So we played into the wind and we knew it was going to be a grind. We tried to keep the ball close. And uh, I think I missed my first two kicks that game, actually. The wind was all over the place. Thankfully, I think I made Saint the John. next eight in a row. And, uh, but when the second, when we, when, um, uh, at halftime, when we changed direction, we knew we had that game under control. And so all Gareth did was bang the ball into the corners and pin them as deep as we could and wait for them to make mistakes, which they did make mistakes and they got frustrated and started committing penalties. But for me, that you know, and your goal as a your role as a goal kicker is to kick the goals. That's that's one of that's one of the things you're doing on the field. So I was doing exactly what I was supposed to be doing. I just had the good fortune that I was on form, and um, and we needed the points. So the, you know, the ball went through the uprights every time I stepped up, uh, which was which was gratifying for every successive third, uh, penalty that went through. I knew we were increasing that margin to to beat the Scots. But my focus was less on what was going on with my kicking game and more sort of how, are we, are we controlling these guys? And if we're attacking into spaces we're not attacking into uh, that are going to leave us exposed, let's change that. So there was a lot, there was more of that chess, chess piece moving than there was about, uh, you know, kicking goals and, and, and celebrating that, that particular. What I, what I like about your statement here is that you're, you're saying this as, as a true rugby person, you're talking mm -hmm. about the game as, as a 15 man unit 15 person unit on the pitch and you're you're talking about that day what it meant to you guys as a team and how you performed as a team and how you responded as a team and how you directed the play as a team that's you don't score your 24 points without those other 14 guys on the pitch doing their thing which is which is I think what you're you're saying but you're not actually you're not actually using those words and I think that's uh, you you can't diminish the fact that all 15 of you guys that were on the pitch and the subs that came in put in that dominant effort against, so, you know, a strong, strong Scottish side, they would have had Gavin Hastings out there and, and players of that ilk. So that was, that was, it was amazing for me to watch. That's when I got hooked on rugby. Um, I was always a follower, but once I watched that game, I thought, all right, I'm a life for now. And, you know, you're, you're one of those ones that uh, are, 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 I guess, for me to blame that I love rugby so much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I'm pleased to hear that. But you're right about the, the, the team thing. I mean, you got individuals within sports and, the, the, the problem I've always had throughout my career is I, I, I was never, I, I never liked celebrating the fact that X so-and-so scored X number of tries or so-and-so kicked X number of penalty goals because it, it is, it's such a team game that way. But, um, you know, we, 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 we're statistically minded as a sports nation and I speak sporting people in general. So they'll focus on who's done what in terms of the tally sheets rather than, okay, what does this mean uh, for us fundamentally as, the team, uh, you know, what happened out there. 
And that's the part that I always found fascinating about rugby is how do you manipulate those situations and control the opponent as best you can? Because Scotland would have been like any other team that we would have faced. They had certain parts of the game that they knew they could exploit that they were better at than we were. It was our responsibility to close those opportunities down and then turn the tide. And uh, so that second half, I don't even remember. I, I just remember, yeah, I, I just, I was so wrapped up in making sure that you kept them pinned down in their, down in their, um, uh, down in their own half and preferably inside the 22. The rest of it is almost irrelevant, you know, because yeah. we knew the outcome. We knew what the outcome was going to be. I imagine when the game was over, and this is just me, you know, thinking, somebody might have said to you, hey, Mark, you just set a world record for points. And you probably would have been, that's cool. What did we do well in this game? And what do we need to work on to prepare for the World Cup? Like I imagine yeah. your mindset and a lot of your teammates' mindsets and your coaches' mindsets were, were in that kind of frame of mind more than anything. Yeah, and you, there was, there was, it was so euphoric because that setting in New Brunswick where they did a fabulous job there. We had such a good time. It was so well organized. The fans were great. I mean, it was uh, at the end of it, I, I you know, you, you thought you'd won the lottery. I mean, it, it was so euphoric, or the World Cup for that matter. I mean, the, the fans were pouring onto the field. Um, one of the curious things as a captain, you, you, you've got these multiple roles and hats you got to wear all the time. What I, all I wanted to do was jump into the stands and head into the change of the boys and slug back a bunch of pints and <laughs> celebrate this thing. Right, but I got drawn away, and I remember one of the guys was Garrett said, "Come on, come on, you can do the interviews later." And I thought, "No, I, I, I got to do this now because now is the time it's got to get done." Mm -hmm. And so uh, while I wanted to run off and do that, I, I had to go and look after the the management side of of looking after the media and, and making sure that messaging is correct. And, and the, the messaging for us was was, uh, "Hey, we've arrived and we're ready and we're coming and uh, be prepared for it." And uh, a message that that did not uh, I, I don't think it hit a real chord with uh, the media in, the, in uh, overseas in continental Europe. They thought, okay, I kind of did pretty well because a lot of the preamble coming up just said, oh, they're interesting, but they're not really going to give us a go here. And we ended up being, as you know, Scotland set the stage for the World Cup. And then went after the World Cup, along with Samoa, who had a great run as well at that World Cup, we were the talk of the town. Yeah. And, uh, and people started taking a real strong look at not only Canada as a nation, but players within it, because it was yeah. right at the forefront of the professional era. Yeah, it was just a few years prior. That. Yeah, that's right. And it rolled over. And then all of a sudden, we got guys that are playing um, are playing overseas with, with decent contracts and with the best players in the world, because they were the best players in the world as well. Yeah. So it, was, uh, it was pretty cool. So... Saying that, you were inducted in the Rugby, Hall, Rugby Canada Hall of Fame last year. Mm -hmm. um, listening to you speak, I, I imagine you were honored. How, how did you look at that? Did you look at that as an individual accolade, which it is? Or do you look at it more like, I'm here because of the great teams I played with as well? Yeah, that, that's, that's a tough one um, in the sense that uh, if without a sort of supporting cast of players, you know, you're, you're, you're not winning games. And so, you know, my, the, I look at these things. I, if you look at, if you look at anybody's sporting career and then laterally when they get inducted into various halls of fame and whatever, whether they're rugby or general sports hall of fame, there's not a player on the planet that would have said or an athlete said, Oh, my end goal here is to get inducted into this. Uh, you know, you just don't do that. You just, you just go about your business and you do your job the best you can. And what happens laterally when you begin to reflect back, uh, certainly in this, uh, this case with the Canadian Rugby Hall of Fame, it was a huge honor. You know, it, it did represent on, on some level um, it, the notion that I had put in a lot of time and a lot of extra time to get to this particular point in my career. But having said that, if you don't get there without all the guys surrounding you. And what, what makes me sad sometimes in these situations are, is the fact that these other guys won't get the, the kind of recognition and they worked equally as hard. They were just in a different role at a different time. But it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely more about the team than anything else. So it was, a, it was a very, very special, very special moment for sure. Yeah, there's some, there's some nice names in there with you. So hats 100%. off from me. That's, you know, huge congratulations. That was, yeah, thank you. That's, that's uh, yeah. very impressive. Um, so we're going to take a break right now. We're going to jump into our quick fire section. Okay, I'm ready. All right, he's ready. So we're going to jump right in. I got about 20 questions here. And it's Whoa. just, this is a chance where everybody gets to see a little bit of your personality and okay. have a little fun with who Mark is. Right. Okay. First half or rugby, last half or more individualized. 
All right. Best team you ever faced? Uh, oh, so much for rapid fire. Um, <laughs> He's thinking already. <laughs> oh, my God. I would say uh, 91 World Cup, All Blacks. All Blacks, yeah. Yeah. That's fair. All right. Best player you ever faced? Um, Hugo Porter. Hugo Porter. That's right. a name that goes way back. You're gonna be, people are going to be Googling that for I, sure. I think I'm going to have to Google that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Argentinian legend. Okay. Next one. Toughest player you ever faced. When I say toughest, I mean you're 1v1 and this guy's coming at you with the ball and you're just praying to God you can get a piece of him to pull him down. Gareth. Gareth? Yes. Yeah, he weighed me by 40 pounds. <laughs> I also played for my half, so. <laughs> All right. The player you love to smash the most. Uh, if I could ever get my hands on him, Rob Robson from James Bay. I took more punches and stomps from him and never got a chance to get back at him, but he'd be top of the list. So for our younger viewers, that was 70s, 80s, 90s style rugby, a little bit punchy exactly. and stomp. Not the 70s. Yes, it was very prevalent. <laughs> so you can't get away with that anymore. All right. Um, sevens or 15s? Um, both. That, you no, know, sevens or 15s? Sevens. Okay. Best match you were ever a part of? Um, the All Black game. Okay. Oh, BC versus Scotland. Okay. I'm taking that. Sounds good. BC versus Scotland. Favorite rugby tradition? Uh, tying up my shoes uh, one minute before walking onto the pitch. I'd never had my laces completely done up. <laughs> All right. Uh, best team you played with? 91 World Cup. 91 World Cup. Your rugby nickname? Uh, Sparky. Sparky. <laughs> Sparky. My kids call me Sparky. All their friends call me Sparky. So. And that came compliments of Bonzo. Bonzo the dog face boy in Edmonton. If you're listening, you're responsible for that. Second year <laughs> university. Thank you. It's stuck, eh? <laughs> oh, it did. All right. Best rugby nickname that you know of? Bonzo. Heard, Bonzo? Bonzo the dog face boy. That's a big nickname. <laughs> All right. So other than tying your cleats a minute before you go on the pitch, was it did you have any other rugby superstitions? Um, yes, I, I um my socks I wouldn't roll up and tape uh until uh, two minutes before the game. So my socks were always down. So and did I'd you pull my socks up and then I'd do the yeah. You know, did you have your garment uh, match back then? No. Is that your timer? Actually, no, that's true. I, I've forgotten about the watch, yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely wore a watch. Okay. Yeah, but that wasn't the, yeah, I remember the sock thing the most, yeah. All right, All right so I asked this one. Um, I, did you watch the uh, Netflix series on Michael Jordan, The Last Dance? I did. Okay. Tell me, for you, in your playing career, who was the Jordan, who was the Pippin, and who was the Rodman? Oof. The Jordan, the Jordan is a comp, is, uh, is if Gareth and Al had children together, that's who <laughs> Jordan would be. Okay. Um, <laughs> what? That's a bit of a nasty thought. I stop. <laughs> we got to move off this. Uh, Pippin, I got to move quickly through this. Uh, Pippin, I would say a guy by the name of Mike Tupper from uh, from the West Coast who is okay. always the most underrated guy that never really got a shot um, and who's the last one Rodman Rod Rodman oh that's 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 a slippery slope there's lots of guys <laughs> that fall into that category all Steve right. Gray Steve Gray yeah all right all right uh, three that you would take golfing could be from any time in history could be athletes it could be celebrities any three you would like to take golfing with you any three of the bulls? I'll take oh. Jordan and Pip. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't take Jordan. He'd smoke me. No, no, no. I would, um, I would take uh, Michael Kieran for the Irish uh, center because apparently he was a scratch golfer and oh, wow. uh, I could probably learn a few things from him. And I would take um, uh, Wayne Shelford, Buck Shelford, because I want to hear about what happened to his thing in France, one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Um, and the last guy I'd take, I'd take a, a friend of mine, Rob Frame, Bully Bob. 
because he's, uh, yeah, for, there's another good nickname, Bully Bob, well-deserved. <laughs> All right. Uh, chips or cookies? Chips. What kind? Uh, plain. Plain chips. French fries or onion rings? French fries. French fries or poutine? Uh, French fries. All right. Favorite beer? French fries. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anything, anything that has pills or after it. Okay. Uh, what's a guilty pleasure? Guilty pleasure, um, trail running. Trail running, all right. Best place for a post-match beer? Um, the, any change room. Nice. Yeah, any change room with the boys. What series are you binge watching right now? Um, 12. Okay. What's Which your is an interesting one, but anyway, you know, go, that's it's, a it's not interesting? I, no, haven't, heard, I yeah. haven't heard of that. What is, what's it about? It's, it's basically this, this woman gets convicted of killing uh, her ex-husband's first lover and their child. And it's, formed, uh, it's filmed in either Norway or Sweden. And okay. it's dubbed over a little bit, but the dubbing's not bad. But it's a fascinating, fascinating story about human character. 12? So, yeah, 12. And it's, it's only, uh, I think we got one more, one more episode to go. So it's only one season. So look right. 12. Watch it. It's worth it. I'll have to look it up. Favorite movie? Apocalypse Now. Really? All right. Yes. Who would play you in the Netflix movie of your life? I don't even know what under life is. It shows you how much I'm on Netflix. What's under life? No, a movie of your life. Of my life. <laughs> oh, oh, my son, Kane. Okay. Yeah. Who would play the leading lady? Uh, my daughter, Elise. Okay. No, that, no that'd, be, that'd be a little too weird. My wife, Claire. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, last one. Who had the biggest impact on you as a player? You've said a few off the top there that got you started into yeah, rugby. Uh, Gary Johnson. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Gary Johnson and Bruce Howe and Dave Doherty. There you go. Oh, sorry. And the fourth one, Ian Burtwell, for different okay. reasons. Yeah. All right. So four good names to drop there. So that's it for the quick fire. That was really well. That was good. That okay. was awesome. Thank you. Yeah. All right. We only got a few questions left here, Mark. Okay. All right. What are your thoughts? We talked about this a little bit before we started recording, but what are your thoughts on what makes a great team player? One that has the capacity to put team before self. I think as, as a species, we are inherently selfish in the sense that, you know, that, which is natural. It's about self-preservation um, as a species. And, uh, but when it comes to sporting events, you've, you've got to be able to put your own interests aside and find a way to make things work uh, for not only for you, but for the team as a whole. Um, and this gets back to what we were talking about earlier about values. And, uh, and, and what I've found is the, the best players that I played with, not talented, but the best players, um, meaning that the, the more complete players, were those who had strong value systems that understood that. And, uh, and, and, and the ones that were do, willing and prepared to do the extras, the extras, the little things that, 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 um, that, that, that often go unnoticed. Like when training ends, even at the national level, like who, who's, who's picking up a few extra balls or cones? Uh, who's, uh, who's helping somebody out uh, with some taping? Who's helping people out? Just all those little things, helping trainers out. Um, those are the value things. Those are the things I really appreciate about being a great teammate is the guys that had that capacity to, uh, to think beyond their own personal needs and look out for the, uh, look out for the others. I couldn't agree more. Um, you played with some great teammates. Do you, can do a few of those guys come to mind uh, speaking of those values? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, they, it, that, that's a long list. And that's one of the great things about our sport is that uh, it, it, I, I hope it remains this way. It, it's a values based sport. And those, uh, those things that make the sport special and make us special as human beings uh, are, are value driven. And so oh, I think there'd be a quite a long list. Some of the guys that uh, jump out, uh, Roy Redu was a guy that was involved in the national program for a long time uh, and ended up in the World Cup. Uh, he was a guy that uh, I, any day of the week, Rob Frame's another guy, Al Sharon. And, I, and if I'm leaving some of them higher profile names, but like 30 years ago, they're not as high profile. I think only Gareth and Al are the only recognizable names back from that era. But those are guys that, uh, that, I, that I know that if I ever got into a pinch, not only on the field, but off the field, that they're a phone call away and they're right there. 
and uh, and you, you can build. And we talked about this earlier. I I can build build a team of 15 mediocre guys that are that are value driven and prepared to work hard, and that's far easier to work with than 15 super uber talented guys who are not prepared to uh, to have the team's best interests at heart. It's like you're you're a family when you're that tight and close knit and have the values of everybody you know, in front of yours. Right. So. Absolutely. You get values aligned like that. Special things happen. You can create environments and, and moments that, uh, that, that transcend lifetimes really that, uh, that are very, very special, but the absence of values, not only in sport, but in life in general, you, it's just, it's a pretty hollow world. Yeah. So you spoke about this a little beforehand, but you played, rugby before the professional era started. Mm -hmm. How difficult was it for you to represent Canada on the national stage while working? At the time, it was, it's just what you did. So I, I don't think there was a, I look back on it, uh, they, and you had guys with varying degrees of, of work ethics. I, I like to think mine was pretty good. I, I trained every day and uh, sometimes twice a day while working still. And it's just what came with the territory. And one of the one of the things that I, that I appreciate about that era is that it was it was pretty simple. It wasn't complicated because there wasn't professionalism. This is what you did, and there was a real romantic attachment to the game that was not driven by money or sponsorship or where are my next set of boots coming from. How come that sponsor didn't do that? And and uh, how come you know so and so hasn't looked after me for this? And what are my my personal needs? So there was something very, very pure in terms of its intent and the design of the game at that particular point in time. So it was really about, about developing yourself as an individual, as an athlete, and making the most of those opportunities while trying to balance what would someone consider your real life. But it was getting to the point, and it's probably that tipping point, uh, where players started to say, hey, I, I can't do this. And certainly I was right on the edge of that going, I don't know if I can continue to to do this full time and, and have this other full time job as well, which is training. Because I missed a lot of work as did many others yeah. as a result of that. So, but it, it was a very pure time, I think, for rugby. Um, and I think the, I mean, the games and sports evolve over time as they should. Uh, and uh, the professional era did definitely change the mindset of players and, and how the game is viewed um, you know, from a larger perspective. And, is part of me would like to see a return to that, but it's an unrealistic expectation, yeah. you know, so that you embrace some of those old school values and what that looked like. It, it is interesting. I, in 1994, my high school team did a, a tour of the UK and we were in Wales for a few days and this was, you know, pre-professionalism and my coach somehow organized for Neil Jenkins to come meet with us. Mm -hmm. Neil's mechanic, I believe he was a mechanic. He, he, he shows up, took his lunch hour off to drive about 30 minutes to meet with us, signed autographs, took pictures with all 35 players, kicked a couple of uh, field goals with his boot, work boots on, got back in his little jalopy and drove home, drove back to work. And I tell this to the players that I coach now, and they're like, well, why was he going to work? You know, he, you know, you said Neil Jenkins was one of the best players in the world at the time. Why was he going to work? Well, it wasn't professionalism. He needed a job in order to – you know, pay his rent, pay his mortgage and buy groceries. He wasn't getting paid to play rugby. So mm -hmm. in just a few short years, that all changed. But it's, it's funny how, or ironic maybe how, as you said, the changes have happened. And it's hard sometimes for the younger generation to fathom what players of your generation went through to kind of get to the top of the game. Yeah, I, I think the core values are there. Um, the, uh, they, they remain in place. I think they, they've just been skewed a little bit differently. You know, th things like this, the social component was, was a major draw for, and continues to be a major draw because it's a very social sport that way. But, uh, you know, the, the ability to sit down in a change room after a game and guilt-free have a beer without being worried whether you're hydrating enough was a pretty <laughs> liberating experience to say, yeah, I'm going to have a couple of pints with the, the boys or the girls or whoever, you know, whatever that, you know, the, the team was playing at the time. And then we'll, we'll go to the clubhouse and have a couple more pints and then we'll go home and celebrate the fact that we had a, uh, a wonderful weekend and you're hanging out with com uh, opponents. And one of the things um, I found really intriguing because this was at the time that professor was just starting to emerge. I played in the South of France for a year in a, a team called uh, Cinco Dance in the Group B. 
And I, you know, I come from a culture that uh, after the match was over, you socialize with the team, and then you got together with the boys, and then it was over. And the French culture was very, very different. So I, at, at, when, after the match was over, there was a post-match function, but there wasn't any, any mingling between the teams in terms of, you know, there was no bon ami there. You know, you just stuck somebody's, you know, fingers and your fingers were in somebody's eyes or whatever else. I mean, it was a bizarre, it was a bizarre landscape, the French rugby scene for a while there. But it was also uh, unbelievably beautiful rugby when it was in its best form. But coming back to the social component, it didn't exist there. And I thought, you know, it's good. I was at the time being paid under the table to play because the professional era wasn't, uh, hadn't emerged yet and hadn't been formalized. But I found, I found it quite intriguing that, that the social dynamic had been missed. And so that connection that I had to the sport in, uh, in what I had grown up with and been associated with was completely different. And I think there are some components of that that have been lost. Um, uh, certainly at, uh, yeah, a writer, it's certainly in Canada. I can't speak for elsewhere, but yeah, there's, there's uh, yeah, that, that social bond is important. And you know, those, those things that tie us together. Yeah, absolutely. So you retire from rugby. What was it like retiring from being on top of your game, you know, leading Canada into the quarters? And then, you know, you're, you're basically done and you're in the workforce. How, how, how was that transition for in your life? You know, Jay, it's a really good question because um, I was uh, at the time in a relationship with uh, somebody that, um, that uh, my ex-wife, who is an international uh, renowned triathlete, and um, it was at the very, very top of her game. And, and I watched, she got injured and I, and I watched her struggle with that a little bit. And, uh, and then I started to talk to a few national team rowers. There's a strong national uh, rowing presence here. And I got to know some of the national team rowers who had just recently retired who were discussing the trials and tribulations from, from going from this athlete who is competing on international stages being looked after to all of a sudden going, okay, where do I belong and where do I fit? And, uh, and subsequent to that, I, I, went, I returned to UVic to do a master's degree and hope to do a sports psych degree in um, uh, addressing this issue, which is the transitional piece from being a com uh, competitive elite athlete into becoming just another member of the pod. And I won't say just a number, n another member, but trying to fit back into regular society again. And it's a real struggle and it's documented. It's a well-known thing. You look at the professional athletes that when they're finished, they, they end up in all sorts of horrible situations because their whole life has been driven around uh, organization structure and accolades and being viewed as that person to go from that. Because the minute you step out of that international realm, out of that spotlight, you are yesterday's news. And it happens like that. And with the exception of a couple of folks in Canada, I would say um, I would say most of the players, both men and women, the minute you retire, you're yesterday's news. And there's a part of your personality and a part of who you are that it gets a bit of juice from that stuff from time to time. But when it's gone, it's gone and it's immediate. So it, it is a struggle. So what I ended up doing was I saw this pattern here and I thought, you know, I, I don't, I'm, I'm really worried about becoming that person. So I threw myself right into a, a post-secondary degree and got super busy on you know, coaching, which I had been doing since I was 20 anyway. I just filled my life with as much stuff that, uh, that kept my, my mind busy because I was concerned about that. But it's, it's a really good question and it's a real thing. And anybody that says it's not a real thing is in some form of denial. You, you go through post-competition uh, syndrome. There's probably some acronym out there for it by now but there's been lots of studies on it and uh, it can be a struggle. So that's how I got through it. I just threw myself into everything I could. And, and that I, I think I came out of it pretty well. Thank well, you. that led you now to uh, Brewis Electric Company, mm -hmm. right? And you're in business development there, but you, you know, you're talking to me about, you're talking to, me, to us about uh, taking sports psychology, but you're in business development. So talk to us about your company, what you guys do and, you know, give yourself a plug, get a little free advertising here. Yeah, I, you know, I, the, uh, and thanks for that opportunity. I've got this electrical contracting company that's got probably about 40 employees and we're based uh, Southern Vancouver Island based. And then I've got an, and, uh, another company, uh, um, Capital City Fire, that does fire alarm work throughout uh, Greater Victoria. So we go into buildings and test to make sure they're functioning okay. And, and for me, the, this process is, uh, is, has been fascinating because of parallels uh, between sport and business and life in general. 
that uh, if you can get in there and establish values and common goals and, uh, and beliefs and harmonize these teams, you can end up uh, transforming companies. And it's no different than building great teams. And, and certainly over the last, um, I've been with both companies over all about eight years now. And I, I got into it um, as I ended up leaving education and because I, I think I'm an entrepreneur, it's what it boils down to. I got heavily involved in this stuff and, uh, and I'm finding right now the real juice I get out of business, although you wanna make money at what you're doing, it's about building the, building the team and how do you make the team better? And it's, it's, there is no difference in stepping onto a coaching uh, paddock somewhere in the country and going, okay, what have I got here? How do I make this better? Okay, I got so-and-so that's got that talent. Maybe they're not best suited in that position. Maybe they belong over here. So it's taking that entity and, and taking all those bits and trying to figure out how they all work together and how do you make the team a better team. And that's the part that I find fascinating. Yeah, that's, that is interesting because if you can – if you can find what the your company's direction is or your team's direction is, and you have your pieces of players or your employees slotted into those right spots that you feel can make your company or your team better, is kind of what coaching is. It's kind of what business management is, is making sure that people are doing what they're suited for, but they're also doing what is suited for the company itself or the team itself. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's also, it, it's, it's, it's instilling, that sense of, you know, the, the values is this recurring theme that I keep, you know, I don't mean to harp on this, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's a fairly prevalent part of my life. And, uh, but it, it's making sure that those values transcend the entire company that everybody understands. This is not only how we do our business, but this is how we treat one another. Nice. Um, yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been interesting. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, before we sign off, any anything th that we missed that you would like us to cover? Any great rugby stories you want to share with us? You can throw an old teammate under the bus. Uh, you know, it's entirely up to you. Yeah, I, I'll tell you what. You, that I one of the most interesting experiences I had. I got invited to play for uh, the World Fifteen against uh, Australia in Australia, the bicentennial. And um, at the time, uh, that was '88. A lot of the listeners here were born like many years after that but um what ended up happening at the time the uh the aussies were a very decent team they would have been in the top three and the all blacks were the all blacks right guys yeah. like that. we had uh, what the reason i bring the all blacks up is they had just won the world cup and the number of their guys i'd say six of them were on that uh that world 15 team so serge blanco who is um a um you know the number 15 for france and uh, widely recognized one of the greatest fullbacks of all time. He and I both got invited. So I'm anticipating I'm going to sit on the bench. So I get there and he had to pull out. So all of a sudden now I'm starting, which is fantastic. So what you don't know at the time is how you're going to perform. Like every athlete, lead athlete wants to know how they compete against the best in the world and how you're going to respond uh, in those environments. So what was really great for me was to get in there and feel really, really comfortable and actually play reasonably well on an international stage with the best players in the world. And the reason I say this was interesting is not because I needed my tires pumped. I went, you know what? I've got six or seven other guys that I would consider at this level that could have stepped into this team and into, into this environment and performed very, very well. And for me, it was a recognition that as a country we were coming of age, that we were actually developing players that could compete not only at an international level, but at that elite level of where you take the best and you stick them all together in there and whether you can actually perform. So that, that to me was a, a really interesting moment for me to reflect back on and go, wow, I'll take, I'll take the six of you and put you into this team with me and we're still going to compete against Australia. We ended up losing by two points that game. Is that, you, so. is that game video, game tape available anywhere? Is that on YouTube? Or? I don't know. I, there was a time back in the day when you had those cassettes. Like I had all my tapes and just like everything else in life, it ends up in a box and uh, uh, in the basement somewhere. And I haven't been able to find it, so I don't know where they are. But who knows? It might be, on, might be on YouTube. I haven't looked, actually. But uh, that's a really interesting game. And it's fun for some of the uh, younger guys to watch that uh, – they take a look at uh, how the game was played back then and just think, oh, my God, it's so slow. And <laughs> I watched with my son and his friends Tonga and Canada play. Actually, they watched it after I watched it, and I was appalled about how many balls we dropped in that game. <laughs> I never understood why the Fords used to get so angry at us for dropping balls. And we're not dropping that many balls. When I run that tape board, it's embarrassing how bad it was. 
Yeah. And that was, that was considered high quality at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Ford's always got mad at the backs when they dropped the ball after 17 scrums in a row, right? Totally. And it was so <laughs> I don't understand why. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for your time. I know you're busy out in BC and uh, it was great listening to some stories and, uh, and hearing your, hearing your story, your rugby story growing up. So thanks yeah. very much for me and uh, enjoy the rest of your summer. Yeah. Great. Jamie, thanks for putting all these uh, podcasts out there for everybody. That's awesome, man. Keep up the good work. Cheers. Thanks. Okay. Cheers, man. Thanks very much, Mark. That was awesome. Uh, huge thanks. Uh, I know it was a busy day for you. You're running your business out there in BC and you took some time to chat with me. Phone even rang a couple of times and you just kind of kept on going with the conversation. I truly appreciate that. Uh, very fine gentleman and, a, and an amazing rugby player. Um, love to get him on again. We're talking about trying to do a, a round table with a, a few of those guys that were at the 91 World Cup. We'll see if we can get that, uh, see if we can get that set up. Coming up next, though, we've got, a, we've got a few nice names. We've got Brett Bukaboom on deck. Had a great conversation with him. Hubert Bidens will be coming up soon, as will Rod Snow. Uh, just trying to uh, nail down times to, to chat with those two guys. And then we've got a couple of uh, modern players. We've got Matt Heaton, Pat Parfrey, uh, both agreed to join. And just uh, got in contact with Sophie DeGood, who World Rugby Magazine names the uh, – best eight man for the women's game and she's only like 20 years old so she's uh, she's going to join us jonathan kaplan who i believe is the most capped rugby official in the world who's also taken over mlr's um i guess head of officiating he's going to be joining us thanks to a uh, nice shout out to bill webb for setting that up and then um, one of my favorites nigel owens the famous welsh ref uh, he's agreed as well. He's in the midst of, uh, you know, working on the family farm. So we're hopefully we'll be able to chat with him in the next month or so, but, uh, he's, uh, he's confirmed to join us as well. Uh, as always, massive thank you to all the essential workers and support staff. It's been great having you guys uh, look after all the rest of us during uh, the pandemic. Uh, schools are opening up soon, so make sure that you're talking to your kids about staying safe and clean and healthy while they're in school. Uh, thanks to Ben Sound Music, as always, for supplying us with a tune. And make sure that if you have a topic request or somebody you want to speak to or uh, you want me to chat with or even the simple thing of you know, a specific question you want to ask one of our upcoming guests, you see who they are, maybe you want to know something about Rod or, or Sophie, then uh, send me a note and I'll, uh, I'll see what I can do about adding that in. Um, never hesitate to reach out. Send me, uh, send me your comments, send me your feedback, and uh, send some voice questions if you want. That's really cool as well. Uh, but until next time, this is Jamie. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay sane, and keep on rocking. <laughs>